are welcome to this brief preview of the Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 17 through 33, reading from the New English Translation of 2019, with variant readings from 5th century or earlier Greek manuscripts. We suggest that you stop the video and review these suggestions for adult Bible study leaders. We have three learning objectives for this lesson. First, at the end, participants will understand that Jesus Christ has set moral standards for Christians. Secondly, participants will begin or continue practicing a three-step method to overcome moral impurity. And thirdly, participants will accept responsibility to correct Christians who have immoral behavior. We're following a nine-point working outline of the book, and we are finishing section five on exhortation for spiritual life. Note the structure of this passage. It's an application of the preceding chapters, beginning with the word so, or therefore. The first imperative is to stop living as Gentiles. By this, Paul means that Gentiles have futile thoughts. They remain alienated from true life. They become increasingly lustful. And then the second imperative to start living as Christians. To do so, one must recall Jesus' teaching, repent of Gentile sins, then keep being renewed by the Spirit of God, and imitate God's kindness. And thirdly, to help each other to overcome sins. Do so by speaking the truth, correcting wrong behavior, working to meet each other's needs, speaking graciously, and showing kindness. Section A, Stop Living as Gentiles. Each time the verses appear, if you are in a group setting, ask someone to read the text aloud. If you are studying alone, stop the video and read the text. After others have shared their observations and posed their queries, you might ask, what is non-believers' main problem? Ensure that they answer from the text. And what consequence comes from that problem, according to these verses? And thirdly, what makes non-believers prove so ignorant? Find your answer in the text. Elaborate on the phrase, as the Gentiles do. In antiquity, Gentiles were known for their premarital sex, homosexual intercourse, idol worship, and the eating of blood and strangled foods. By way of contrast, the ideal in the Jewish community was sexual abstinence before marriage, male-female marital fidelity, faith in one true God, and the eating of clean foods. Christians, then, if ethnically Gentile, were to become ethically Jewish, that is, in their morality. You might discuss together, what are your church's moral standards for members, and what are the moral standards for clergy, that is, church leaders? Do local folk know these standards? Verse 19 explain that indecency means a lack of self-constraint, according to the Greek-English lexicons. Impurity, then, are sexual sins and unnatural vices. So discuss together, who is responsible for their indecent behavior? Or, did the devil make me do it? And then, what is the connection with greediness Think about lust becoming stronger. B. Start living as Christians. This is how you learned Christian truth. Verses 20 and 21. Pose this query. What did we learn about Christ? 
review together some of the teachings of Jesus as noted here, and then ask, what truth is in Jesus? See the following verse. Thirdly, what are some ways in which you changed after you learned about Christ? Repent, be renewed, and imitate God. After reading aloud verses 22 through 24, discuss together what are the three steps to change bad behavior. Find them in the text. Why are all these you pronouns in the plural? This is for the community. Before proceeding, teach these three steps to personal renewal. First, the command to lay aside your corrupt old self which is subject to deceitful desires. One way to do so is to pray, Get off me! Secondly, invite the Holy Spirit of God to renew your mind with the truth you have learned from Jesus. Pray, help me. And thirdly, put on your new self, whom God creates to be like Jesus, who remains righteous and holy. Pray to him, change me. Then ask, how often must we do so? Well, as often as needed. How is this method different from self-help psychology? Well, it overlaps with psychology, but enjoys the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit. Point C. Help each other to overcome sins. After reading verse 25, ask, How is this exhortation or command similar to secular ethics? Well, the ideal is the same. And then, in this context, that is, in these verses, what truth does Paul have in mind? Are we to be teaching theology, history, church doctrine, or are we to teach each other Christian morality? Now, how do my sins affect you? Well, remember, we are members one of another. And why should you not stay out of my private life? Your life in Christ is not private, for we are a community. Verses 26 and 27, when Paul said to be angry and do not sin, do not let the sun go down on the cause of your anger, he was quoting Psalm 4, verse 4, which reads, Tremble and do not sin. Ponder in your heart upon your bed and be still. How did he mistranslate? Well, he knew the Greek Septuagint version, which reads, be angry, employing the Greek verb orgizo. One can tremble with fear or with anger. The phrase, the cause of your anger, is one Greek word, parogizmos, which means provoking to anger, an action that calls forth anger in someone. That is to say, what causes your anger or what causes your fear? Some have noted that verse 26 and 27 seems to be misplaced in a discussion of community morality to deal with personal anger. Thus, there are two interpretations. There are those who think that these verses concern a personal issue, and so they paraphrase, When you feel angry, or if you feel angry, be careful not to commit a sin. Get over it before bedtime, lest the devil tempt you. They might cite a verse such as Hosea 7, 6. All night their anger smolders. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. Others say this seems to be a communal issue. And so they paraphrase. When someone in the church commits moral sin, the rest of you should tremble with fear or possibly anger, so quickly go speak truth to him, lest the devil ruin his testimony or his character and bring God's judgment upon the church.
In the first century of this era, when Paul wrote this text, he and many of his readers, especially Jewish readers, were familiar with extra-biblical literature called the Psalms of Solomon, which Protestants consider to be apocryphal. These verses read, God exposed their sins before the sun. All the earth knew the righteous judgments of God. In secret places under the earth were their transgressions of the law in provocation. Using the same word, parogizmos. They committed incest, son with mother and father with daughter. These psalms were originally written in Hebrew or Aramaic in the first or second century BCE against the Hasmonean dynasty who ruled over Judea. So from about 140 BCE to 37 BCE, the text is preserved in Syriac and in 11th to 15th century manuscripts of the Greek Septuagint. So by using the term parogizmos, Paul knew that many would think of these verses which expose the sins of community leaders. After reading aloud, verse 28, discuss together in what ways does true repentance lead to change of behavior. Christians are those who have repented and put their faith in Christ. Then, How should a call to change one's ways be made part of Christian evangelism? Should sinners know in advance that if they become Christians, God will want to change their behavior? And then, what if the one who has need is a flake who will not work? Well, think of some scriptures that deal with that case. Elaborate on repentance. Here is a definition. Repentance remains a radical change of spiritual allegiance to Jesus Christ, leading to a change of behavior, entailing from the verses we've read, worship of the God of the Bible, obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, truthful, respectable speech, sexual purity and marital faithfulness, honesty with generosity, peaceful relations with others, kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. After reading verse 29, pose this query. Well, what if spicy language is my normal way of speaking? Well, we are asked to repent of our normal ways. Then, what if I cannot think of anything beneficial to say? Well, remain quiet, or ask the Holy Spirit to bring something to mind. And thirdly, how could I make a strong point without using the F word? Well, the Holy Spirit can teach you a new vocabulary. After you read verses 30 and 31, discuss what it means not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Ask the question, what grieves the Holy Spirit of God? The answers are right in front of you. These include bitterness, which is animosity leading to harsh speech, anger or intense displeasure, wrath, a strong indignation leading to retribution, quarreling is especially shouting back and forth, slander is denigrating or defaming others in order to harm them. And malice is ill will seeking to cause trouble. God does not treat us in that way, and he is grieved when we do so. The answer then is, be kind one to another. After reading verse 32, explain what it means to be kind. According to Greek usage, kindness is meeting a relatively high standard being morally good and benevolent towards others. So ask, is my kindness strategic or is it sincere? Do I fake it or do I mean it? To be compassionate 
is to have tender feelings towards others. Forgiving could mean to give freely, even to cancel money that is owed, but especially to show oneself gracious by forgiving others their wrongdoing. To complete your study, ask others to share one truth, insight, belief, or action that they learned from the text this week. For next time, let us read a chapter of Ephesians each day in versions that we trust. Then let us study Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, preparing comments and queries to share during the next session.